iconic shoreline of South Padre Island bracing for Hurricane Delta's storm surge. The dangerous system now slamming directly into Louisiana. Breaking news making landfall Delta barreling into the Gulf Coast tonight. The 25th named storm of the year hitting less than two months after Hurricane Laura left a trail of devastation displacing thousands from their homes. Our Ginger Z and Rob Marciano are both in the storm zone tonight with the latest as Delta strikes. President Trump set to host his first in-person event since being hospitalized. Questions over whether he's still infected with COVID while welcoming hundreds of guests to the White House tomorrow. The president reveals he, quote, could have been a bad victim and falsely calls one of his experimental treatments a cure. COVID crisis, the CDC predicts up to 20,000 more deaths by election day. Dr. Deborah Burks warns about the virus spreading differently now than it did in the spring. And the new guidance from the CDC about risk factors if you're overweight. One of the 13 suspects in the alleged terror plot to kidnap the Michigan governor in court today. Why prosecutors allege the group wanted to set off a civil war. Breaking down the newly released police body camera video from the night Breonna Taylor was shot and killed. Her confused and distraught boyfriend realizing what happened and the potential missteps from the crime scene in the minutes and hours that followed. And the growing election concern, naked ballots. And how to get some much needed clothes on them so your vote counts. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Between the pandemic, the protests, and the presidential race, 2020 has been relentless. But for those in the Gulf Coast, add to all of that a punishing storm season. Tonight, Hurricane Delta is charging towards land and will be the fourth named storm to hit Louisiana just this year and the all-time record 10th to hit the U.S. this season. Let's take a live look now at the powerful Category 2 storm down from a Category 3 earlier today, but still packing quite a punch with 100 mile per hour winds. Ahead of that major storm, the rush to high ground cars streaming out of Lake Charles, a community that knows all too well the dangers of this record hurricane season. Many residents haven't even had a chance to rebuild from Hurricane Laura, which devastated this community six weeks ago. We are standing by to get a live update from the Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana and Ginger Z. We'll have the storm's latest track in just a moment. But first, we want to start with our Rob Marciano in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Tonight, Hurricane Delta is making a record-breaking landfall in southwest Louisiana. Pounding waves and howling wind. Up to 11 feet of storm surge in spots. This is a big storm. We've got winds of 115 miles per hour. Oh! Lake Charles took a direct hit from Category 4 Hurricane Laura just six weeks ago. One of the most powerful storms to ever hit the U.S. Many homes still covered in blue tarps as families rebuild. Debris still piled up in neighborhoods. The winds are picking up now here in Lake Charles, and with these debris piles all over the city, they're filled with razor-sharp aluminum, wood with rusty nails that, with that eye wall coming through, could all be airborne. At this time, uh, everyone uh, in the storm's path really needs to be focused on sheltering in place. Thousands of Lake Charles families clogging evacuation routes ahead of Delta, a two and a half hour trip to Houston, reportedly taking 10 hours. I pray today for these little babies. I pray for life, Lord. This hospital evacuating babies from their intensive care unit. Doctors and nurses praying for their safe return. I pray for Louisiana and all those on the Gulf Coast. Over 100 shelter dogs airlifted out of the storm zone. Delta's effects felt from Louisiana all the way to Texas tonight. Hurricane's landfall making history as the 10th named storm to hit the U.S. in a single season. Rob, looks like you are just right in the thick of it right there. What are you most concerned about there in the Lake Charles area? Certainly a place that you know very well. Of course, you were just there. Yeah, you know, uh, I tell you what, Lindsay, that those, those piles of debris is what I'm most concerned about. And just to be clear, we are in a large area of a, of a huge hotel parking lot that they're actually using as a staging area for recovery vehicles. You see some of those back out there and uh, utility crew vehicles. They've been stationed here for weeks trying to put this town back together. And now this, I mean, we're in the northern Iowa right now of Hurricane Delta coming ashore, the second hurricane to hit this town in just six weeks. And I used to live in this town, uh, Lindsay. Uh, it's heartbreaking to see such a slow recovery, a massive recovery effort they've had, and they've made a little bit of progress. And now several steps backwards and a dangerous night ahead. The only saving grace is that so many people 
left yesterday for safety reasons. So hopefully when this is over later on tonight, we don't have any injuries or loss of life, Lindsay. Yeah, one step forward, two steps back. Rob, thank you so much. Stay safe. We'll check back in with you later tonight. Storm has been its way to shore, but it sounds like it could still do some significant damage. Yeah, we still have a Category 2 hurricane moving on to the Louisiana coast. And that always has the potential to do significant damage. Lindsay, we've already seen seven feet of storm surge, and we've already seen gusts above 70 miles per hour. So let me take you to the map. This thing is imminent here. We are seeing some of the worst of it and will for the next couple of hours as it makes its way north and east. It's moving at 14 miles per hour. That's the good news, and that's why we're not going to see feet of rain, probably more on the order of 5 to 10 inches when it's all said and done. However, However, as we go through time, you are going to end up seeing more in the way of wind, even up to, say, Greenville, Mississippi, by tomorrow morning when you time it out. That at 9 a.m., that's where that map took you. I also wanted to share with you that as this moves to the north and east, the remnants of it will get picked up, and even New York and Pennsylvania could feel some of the moisture uh, that remains from it Sunday night into Monday. Now, storm surge, I talked about that, but Vermilion Bay, that area that is just south where I was, Delphum, Louisiana, this morning, that's as good to see 7 to 11 feet. That push of water is what we get really concerned with. It's already filling some of the roads down there. And we're also going to be concerned with that 5 to 10 inches. Even though it doesn't look like a lot, you add it on top of surge, and that's when you can have a problem. So Category 2 right after Category 4, just as Rob has said, that's a big issue. Lake Charles, Cameron, that already got hit so hard, you can't have an 80-mile-per-hour gust, Lindsay. Yeah, they just keep coming in one after another on the Gulf Coast there. Ginger Z, thank you, and stay safe. And we're going to get a live update from the Louisiana Lieutenant Governor in just a moment. But we go now to those new developments in that alleged plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer before the election, foiled by state authorities and the FBI. Thirteen suspects are now under arrest, seven of them alleged members of an extremist militia group, all charged in the alleged domestic terror plot. So what do authorities say they're looking for now? Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, photos confirming that some of the men charged in an alleged plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer were present when demonstrators, some of them heavily armed, stormed the State House in April. Sources tell ABC News that suspects Michael and William Null were among those at Michigan's Capitol that day, armed and apparently angry at the state's lockdown due to the pandemic. Authorities claim the two men served as lookouts while other militia members took photos and video of the governor's vacation home with the goal to attack before Election Day. Time was at, of the essence in terms of moving forward on this uh, from a law enforcement perspective. Am I worried about uh, other events? Absolutely, I am. ABC News has learned authorities are going through documents, computers, and any smartphones they can get access to in an urgent effort to determine if their other co-conspirators. In a wiretap obtained by the FBI after it infiltrated the group, one member allegedly says Governor Whitmer, quote, has no checks and balances at all. She has uncontrolled power. At the time of the April demonstration, the president sided with those angry that Whitmer's restrictions went too far, tweeting, liberate Michigan. Just one day prior, however, he'd unveiled the White House's toughest guidelines for reopening America, but saying the governors would call the shots. They all want to open. Nobody wants to say shut, but they want to open safely. So do I. President Trump also calling the governor that woman. Today, she fired back at tweets he posted last night, still criticizing her. You know what? A decent human being would pick up the phone and say, are you okay? Since he first called me that woman from Michigan, we saw an increase in hateful language in um, social media. Former Vice President Biden also pushing back. The president has to realize the words he utters matter. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, since these arrests, we've heard from a Michigan sheriff who spoke at one of those rallies in protest of the lockdown in May, and he seemed to defend these suspects. Yeah, I watched the video in which he's at one of these particular rallies challenging the governor's measures. Uh, in the video, he talks about the fact that perhaps the men were trying to make some kind of arrest. So he's clearly not on the same page with the FBI. They say this was a real plot, not some attempt to make a citizen's arrest, Lindsay. And, and we also had that development today in the case of Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old accused of killing those two protesters in Kenosha, Wisconsin. What's the latest on that, Pierre? Well, he appears to be fighting extradition. He's claiming that this is some kind of political prosecution, Lindsay. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. 
and Delta has just officially made landfall. So joining us now is Lieutenant Governor of the state of Louisiana, Billy Nungesser. Lieutenant Governor, thanks so much for joining us tonight. What can you tell us about the conditions that your state is facing right now and what's your biggest concern? Well, our biggest concern is hopefully nobody stayed behind. Um, two hits from two hurricanes back to back is unprecedented here in Louisiana. And uh, with so much debris across Louisiana still piled on the roadsides with that wind, uh, those objects are going to be flying all over and is going to be very dangerous for anyone that's in the hurricane's path. And Hurricane Laurie, as you just mentioned, slammed into Louisiana in August, hitting many communities really hard. Thousands are still displaced. Tell us more about their situation tonight. Right. We have close to 10,000 people still scattered across Louisiana in other areas like New Orleans and hotels, some as far away as Texas, that still haven't made it back home uh, to check on their homes since it was destroyed by that hurricane, and yet they're being hit again. So the devastation that's going to be in that area of the, the state uh, is going to be pretty sustained for this, this type of storm. It's just unprecedented to see two storms back to back, and with the COVID-19 um, that's why we reached out to the White House and asked them to waive the, the local match, uh, something the local uh, parishes will not be able to make uh, under these conditions. So hopefully the White House will waive that and uh, we won't be forgotten after this storm comes ashore as we begin to rebuild Louisiana. Let's turn now to coronavirus. How has the pandemic affected your state's response to these storms and the ability to shelter evacuees? Well, we've got volunteers that are out there, been feeding people, uh, working on the homes, and not putting them in group shelters. We've got just about every hotel outside of the areas that we hit filled up with people that had to evacuate and doesn't have a home to go back to. So the hotels throughout New Orleans still have thousands of people that have lost their home and evacuated from the last storm, still living away from their home in those hotels because you can't put them in group shelters uh, because of the COVID. 19. It's made it very difficult to evacuate people. And during the debate Wednesday night, Vice President Pence was asked whether he believes that climate change can be blamed for the nature of these storms. Pence said that he'll, quote, follow the science, which actually does suggest that these storms are changing in a way that makes them more dangerous to humans. So I'll rephrase the moderator's question to you, not whether you believe that climate change is a problem, especially with these storms, but rather, what do you think that we as a nation can do to curb climate change and this onslaught of natural disasters? Well, it's climate change, the rise in sea level, and coastal erosion. All three of those are adding to more storms, stronger storms, hitting the coast. And there's, there's you know, it's great evidence here in Louisiana uh, seeing so many. I think we're in the cone six times this year, unprecedented storms in the Gulf of Mexico, and they seem to be getting stronger. Something's causing that. And the sea rise, the climate change, coastal erosion is going to make that storm have a greater impact every time it slams the shores of Louisiana. And lastly, as we see the inevitable images of devastation this weekend, what are the ways that people around the country can help people who are going to get hit hardest by this storm? Well, I tell you, it's, it's you know, we're a great producer of oil and gas and natural gas here in Louisiana. And whenever those refineries shut down, that drives the price up. So getting everything back online quickly, but also that the country doesn't forget. Uh, the, the real work begins as soon as this storm leaves Louisiana. And we've got to help those people rebuild their lives. And people across America have been so generous through the Red Cross and many faith-based groups helping those people get back on their feet, and we appreciate that. Our thanks to you, Billy Nungesser, Louisiana's Lieutenant Governor. Stay safe tonight. Thank you. And now to the race for the White House, just 25 days until Election Day, and more than 5 million Americans have already voted. The president is still fighting the virus after his diagnosis a week ago, but he's now already planning to hold his first in-person event at the White House tomorrow. ABC's Mary Bruce has the latest. Just one week after he was hospitalized and with questions swirling about whether he could still be contagious, President Trump tonight is planning to resume in-person events. I feel better now than I did two weeks ago. It's crazy. And I recovered immediately, almost immediately. Though the president insists he's no longer taking medication, doctors tonight haven't answered questions about his condition and that powerful steroid he was taking that could mask symptoms of the virus. The president, back in the West Wing today, at first said he would travel to Florida Saturday for a rally, but now planning to speak to supporters from the balcony on the South Lawn of the White House. 
It was just today Dr. Anthony Fauci labeled one of Trump's last big White House events a super spreader. We had a super spreader event in the White House, and it was in a situation where people were crowded together and were not wearing masks. So uh, the data speak for themselves. At least 34 people in the White House orbit have now tested positive. Trump spent two hours on the radio today with Rush Limbaugh, acknowledging last week he was not in great shape. I might not have recovered at all from COVID. But now he insists he's cured thanks to the experimental antibody treatment Trump received, a treatment only given to about 10 people outside of clinical trials. I can tell you it's a cure. And I'm talking to you today because of it. And, you know, because I think I could have been a bad, I could have been a bad victim. Dr. Fauci pushing back, saying one case does not mean the antibody treatment is a miracle. I think it's a reasonably good chance that the antibody that he received, the Regeneron antibody, made a significant difference in a positive way in his course. When you have only one, you can't make the determination that that's secure. Trump's doctor saying in a statement the president is devoid of any indications to suggest progression of illness, adding, I fully anticipate the president's safe return to public engagements. But in reality, we know very little about his true medical condition. His doctor hasn't taken questions since Monday, and the White House is refusing to say when Trump last tested negative, which would help the American people know where the president is in the course of the virus. In an interview overnight, Trump heard clearing his throat. Absentee is okay, <clears throat> because absentee ballots. <clears throat> Today with Limbaugh, no coughing. And his opponent, Joe Biden, tonight criticizing the president's behavior so soon after his diagnosis. His reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis. The destabilizing effect it's having on our government is unconscionable. He didn't take the necessary precautions to protect himself or others. And the longer Donald Trump is president, the more reckless he gets. And Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, we know that the commission just officially canceled that debate that was scheduled to take place on Thursday. We know that Joe Biden is now going to be doing that town hall right here on ABC News. What do we know about Trump's schedule for that day? Well, Lindsay, we actually just learned that the president plans to do a separate town hall on Thursday instead. And sources tell us that he plans to hold in-person events every single day next week. We know he has been itching to be get back out there on the trail. He certainly plans to do so. And meanwhile, some developments on those on-again, off-again negotiations on more economic stimulus. What's the latest on the White House's position and how Congress is responding? Yeah, Lindsay, there has been major whiplash from the president on this all week. Earlier in the week, he said that there would be no deal until after the election. And then today, changing his tune, saying that he wanted both sides to go big, to come up with some kind of a big deal. The reality here, there is no compromise in sight. In fact, Republican leader Mitch McConnell today admitted that any kind of deal is unlikely until after the election. That means that millions of Americans who are hoping for some kind of relief from Washington are simply going to have to wait. Lindsay. All right, Mary Bruce, our thanks to you for your reporting. And now to the latest on the coronavirus as fears of a second wave are growing tonight, especially in the Northeast, as the CDC forecasts up to 20,000 more Americans could die by Election Day. Tonight, more than 213,000 American lives have already been lost and 11 states are seeing record hospitalizations. And even with a potential vaccine in the coming months, Dr. Anthony Fauci is warning it may be toward the end of next year before we can expect some degree of normality. ABC's Whit Johnson has the latest. Tonight, an urgent warning about the resurgence of coronavirus in the Northeast. With colder weather moving in, Dr. Deborah Burks of the White House Coronavirus Task Force saying there are troubling signs. You can see the virus moving up the country. That community spread is now occurring with small gatherings day after day in households and families and friends. The CDC now predicting up to 20,000 more COVID deaths by Election Day. Today, officials cracking down on hotspots around New York City, closing schools and non-essential businesses, threatening fines and even arrests for those who don't comply. In New Jersey, hospitalizations are on the rise. We are anticipating a second wave. This wave has a potential to become a surge. Nationwide, more than 56,000 new infections on Thursday, nearly a two-month high. 11 states hitting record hospitalizations this week, including Montana, 
This hospital in Billings considering doubling up rooms in the ICU to take in more patients. We are hitting our surge right now. Every day is a challenge. A deadly new outbreak at a California nursing home. At least nine residents killed by COVID in Watsonville, dozens more infected. Our very last resort is evacuation of the facility, actually sending these patients elsewhere. But in Wisconsin, a remarkable recovery. 60-year-old Lupita Salas now back home after battling COVID for 177 days in the hospital. Because the scary situation when you can't breathe, it's like being reborn again. And tonight, the CDC is now expanding its warning on risk factors, saying it's not just obesity, but simply being overweight could put you at a higher risk of contracting severe illness from COVID-19. More than 70% of adults in the U.S. are either overweight or obese. Lindsay. Okay, Whit, our thanks to you. And when we come back, we'll show you the dramatic moments after Brianna Taylor was fatally shot by Louisville police. What did her boyfriend do? How did police react? More on the new bill introduced by Nancy Pelosi and why she wants a commission set up to evaluate the fitness of future presidents. But up next, it's the rule that could have a significant impact on the swing state of Pennsylvania. In tonight's Ballot Watch, we explain what a naked ballot is and why so many in that state are concerned. On your court. Get set. Let's go. Get ready. The team with the highest card total could be leaving with a hundred thousand dollars to shop bam 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 till you drop down. <laughs> Leslie Jones host Supermarket Sweep premier Sunday October 18th on ABC. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore. The action. The adventure. And the originals. There's no limit to what you'll find. These are your worlds. So come on. Dive deeper into the universes you love, wherever and whenever you want them. You'll find them all here on Disney+. Plus. Now could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see you were so fine, I had to remind myself to breathe. I feel something when I see you. Let's do this. How's your quarantine going? <sighs> Tonight, with just 25 days till Election Day, we wanted to take a closer look at a new phenomenon in 2020, the so-called naked ballot. That's the term for a mail-in ballot that's not properly sealed in a required secrecy envelope used in some states. And for the first time this fall, Pennsylvania will invalidate any mailed ballots that do not use the secrecy envelope, raising the stakes in a critical battleground and now drawing some star-powered voices, hoping to raise awareness about this issue. Here's Devin Dwyer with tonight's Ballot Watch. It has Hollywood stars stripping down to bare skin. Did you know that ballots could be naked? And if you don't do exactly what I tell you, your ballot could get thrown out. So-called naked ballots sent in without a sealed security envelope, the target of a new PSA. After one critical battleground state for the first time, plans to toss those ballots out. Pennsylvania. 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 There are two envelopes you have to stuff your ballot in. Otherwise, it's called a naked ballot. And you don't want to have one of those. For years, officials counted otherwise valid mail ballots received without a secrecy envelope. But last month, after the Trump campaign challenged the practice, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that naked ballots violate the law. It was a huge decision, especially when we're talking about the potential for a hundred 
thousand votes in Pennsylvania alone being tossed out because they forgot their secrecy envelope. This is a state that Donald Trump won by 44,000 votes. So when you think about 100,000 votes being tossed out, it's a really big issue. A record two and a half million Pennsylvania voters have requested to vote by mail this fall. Democrats outnumbering Republicans in requests by more than two to one. For them, the stakes are especially high. I think that <laughs> the ruling and the prospect of throwing votes out is absurd. Andre Carrington of Philadelphia, who usually votes in person, opted to vote absentee this year because of the pandemic. He says he paid extra attention to the envelope before mailing it in. So instead of just putting it in the envelope with the postage paid marked on it, mm -hmm. I just made sure that that blank envelope that said secrecy envelope was in there. The idea of protecting the privacy of how people vote and who they are doesn't extend to preventing them from voting. 16 states send secrecy envelopes to voters, but Pennsylvania is the only state that will now disqualify ballots that arrive without one and give voters no way to fix the mistake. The idea was to protect the voters' private ballots as it's being extracted. Well, now there's equipment and there's also sort of the way that you do the process that uh, can protect the voter regardless. But it is not a required element to count a ballot or it's not required for eligibility of the voter. Why do you think this, the state Supreme Court upheld that requirement? Well, in their law, it is, it is more specific than a lot of laws around the country. And it does say that the ballot will not be accepted if, uh, if, if that's not present. In court documents, the Trump campaign argued the secrecy envelope is essential to ensure the secrecy of absentee and mail-in ballots and to prevent fraud. But Democrats say the extra envelope is a vestige of the past and has nothing to do with ensuring a valid vote. We're trying to make sure everybody can vote. And if you are afraid of people voting, then you're afraid of people being able to make a choice about your record. State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta from Philadelphia says enforcement of the secrecy envelope rule in his state is stoking unnecessary concern over mail-in voting. People weren't sure for a long time whether or not they were going to be able to drop off their ballots at a drop-off location. Um, you have the issue with Trump encouraging um, people who aren't poll workers to just show up at locations to try to intimidate voters. So there's a lot of confusion in the air. And this is not about Democrats or Republicans or independents. This is about whether or not we're going to have a functioning democracy. And I've said to people, if you're not frustrated, you're not paying attention. How widespread is voter fraud in Allegheny County? Voter fraud? Uh, almost non-existent. I, we have had almost no instances of voter fraud. Is a secrecy envelope critical to preventing fraud? I don't think that a secrecy envelope is really what stops fraudulent voting. But instead, mandating that a secrecy envelope is there in order for the vote to be counted is a way that voters are disenfranchised because votes will be tossed out. If there is a ballot that is submitted and missing a secrecy envelope, it won't even be discovered until it's already election day and it's too late for the voter to vote via another method. No one knows for sure how many votes might be tossed out since counties don't track naked ballots because they've never been disqualified before. The more we talk about this, I think you get that number down. Um, a lot of people, you know, maybe thought it was an extra envelope and weren't really sure what to do with it, but now people know. Andre Carrington's advice for avoiding a naked ballot is simple. I followed the instructions and I knew that if I needed help, I could get it. So I just encourage anybody to say, uh, if they're unsure, ask for help. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. No longer just a matter of CYA. We are talking about CYB, cover your ballot. Our thanks to Devin for that important reminder. And still ahead here on Prime, the urgent new warning just before Amazon Prime Days, how scammers are now targeting online shoppers. Twitter is unveiling new rules that they hope curb potential chaos on Election Day, we'll explain. And the lights on Broadway have been sadly shut off until May. Our look at the devastation the pandemic has brought on the entertainment industry. But first, our tweet of the day, Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban updating the world on the condition of troubled NBA player Delonte West. The waters of the Outer Banks are unforgiving and full of riches for the fishermen who dare. The best of the Northern Fleet are heading south. But the local 
locals know where the giants lie. And if you thought the waters were unforgiving, wait until the battle begins. Wicked Tuna Outer Banks. New episode Sundays at 9 on National Geographic. We move up to the vehicle. He detonates the bomb. The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation. Advance made contact. The takedown of the bomber. Now streaming on Hulu. It was a fairy tale love story. He was the closest to Prince Charming. That George Clooney feel, sexy. She was swept off her feet. He would record these video love messages to me. I love you very much. Then he proposed, planning an A-list wedding. And... We're getting married by the Pope. Oh. oh no, 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 I'm not joking. We're getting married by the Pope. But it's complicated. What if this is all a lie? I'm Whoopi Goldberg, and this is The Con. Premieres Wednesday on ABC. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Hello? This is Montana Highway Patrol. Did you're looking for a couple of missing teenagers. That's right. When the night Last seen in a red focus. Has gone. The steering wheel is getting stiff. Lock the door. We're fine. No, I won't be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. Got ourselves a predicament. When the night Welcome back, everybody. We turn now to how COVID-19 has ravaged the American art scene as so many live events from theater performances to musical festivals have been canceled during these long months. We take a look by the numbers. The coronavirus has had a devastating $13.9 billion economic impact on America's art sector. 96% of arts and cultural organizations in the U.S. have had to cancel events during this pandemic, leaving 63% of creative workers now unemployed, according to the Americans for the Arts. 444 days. That's how long Broadway theaters will now go dark after it was announced today that they will not reopen until at least the end of May 2021. Last year, these world famous venues drew 14.6 million theater goers and sold $1.8 billion worth of tickets. And before the pandemic, New York State's arts and cultural sector contributed $120 billion to the state's economy, translating into 7.5% of its economic output. Still lots to get to here on Prime. We explore minute by minute the moments after police opened fire inside Breonna Taylor's apartment. Our conversation with this year's Nobel Peace Prize winners. And what's better than two parents? How about three legally recognized parents? And nope, we're not talking about blended families. Confused? Stay with us. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. This is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. I'm very thankful that these men are fine. Tuesday, October 13th, we respect your wishes. The Bachelorette is back. This is the perfect place to fall in love. But respect the rumors. Do not ever talk to me like that. It's true. What? This is the most shocking season ever. I say sick. We. That's crazy. Do. <laughs> declare. Congratulations, you've just blown up The Bachelorette. The Bachelorette season premiere Tuesday, October 13th on ABC. Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore the action, the adventure, and the originals.
there's no limit to what you'll find. These are your worlds. So come on, dive deeper into the universes you love, wherever and whenever you want them. You'll find them all here on Disney+. Plus. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Hurricane Delta is making a record-breaking landfall in southwest Louisiana. The storm is coming right to this community of Welsh, Louisiana. A hurricane's landfall making history as the 10th named storm to hit the U.S. in a single season. It is very clear that southwest Louisiana is going to get more of a punch from this than we would like to see. Still reeling weeks later, residents now racing to get out of Delta's way. I drive around and see all this debris, and it's pretty rough. After tonight, tomorrow, that stuff can be blown all over the place. Coronavirus cases are on the rise in 28 states, and nine of those states are seeing record numbers of current hospitalizations. I've never seen a time quite like this. It's definitely putting a tremendous amount of pressure on our community. An internal health and human service memo obtained by ABC News indicates 25% of hospitals across the country have more than 80% of their ICU beds filled. That number was 17 to 18% during the summertime. Everybody should wear a mask, literally universally. Today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced a bill to create a commission on presidential capacity that would potentially judge the mental or physical fitness of a sitting president and determine if there's a need for a transfer of power. A president's fitness for office must be determined by science and facts. This legislation applies to future presidents. But we are reminded of the necessity of action by the health of the current president. The 17 person panel would include the sitting vice president, plus eight former executive branch members, and eight medical professionals chosen equally by congressional Democrats and Republicans. You suggested that President Trump has an altered state of mind. Uh, I just said he clearly he is under medication. Any of us who is under medication of that seriousness is in an altered state. Twitter is announcing sweeping changes to how posts are shared ahead of the 2020 election. Instead of just hitting a button to retweet posts, users will now be directed to a screen encouraging them to add commentary before retweeting. Users viewing tweets the company labels misleading will also start seeing a new pop-up prompt linking to information the company deems credible. Twitter says the changes are designed to slow the spread of misinformation. Barbie is using her YouTube channel to raise awareness about racism. In a new video, Barbie and her friend Nikki speak to kids about racism, tackling the issue head on. Take a look. This stuff isn't easy to talk about. Which is exactly why we have to talk about it. It's a tough conversation, but I'm glad we're having it. People might think that my life looks fine, but the truth is I and so many other black people have to deal with racism all the time. And the video was posted on Wednesday along with a tweet saying, together, let's keep listening, keep learning, and take action to inspire change. Let's keep listening and learning. And we turn now to the Breonna Taylor case. And tonight we're seeing new body camera footage of the chilling moments after Taylor was shot dead by police officers in her home last March. This was after her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, fired a shot, which police say injured one of those officers. The officers have said that they announced themselves before breaking into the home. But Walker disputes that, saying that he thought they were intruders. Take a look at what happened next. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Walk straight back, I don't send this dog on you. Walk back to my boy. Walk back, I don't send this dog. Walk back to me. Keep on walking. Walk down. Walk. Make your hands in the air, get down on your knees. Dramatic body cam footage released by the Louisville Metro Police Department shows Kenneth Walker, Brianna Taylor's boyfriend, moments after her death. What did I do? 
Who else is in the apartment? Nobody. My girlfriend's dead. Tell them we have one ten fifteen. What? How's your girlfriend? I don't know. Inside? I, yeah, somebody. Uh, that is. Y'all was banging at the door, and she said, "Who is it?" And they just started shooting. No, no, we down three Who times. Police search warrant. There's somebody in there dead. That. Yeah, my girlfriend. It's Who was shooting at us? Who was shooting at us? <laughs> we have to go in if there's somebody. What, what is this about? We don't. Uh, dude, we go. SWAT can come. We're, we're both we're just going back there. to work. Hey, hey boss. Where, where is she at the apartment? She's on the ground. Where at? In the hallway. What kind of gun did she shoot? Uh, it's a, a nine. It's a regular nine millimeter. Did she shoot or you shoot it? It was her. You scared. Right. I'm spinning out. I just kick. I'm gonna spin out behind you. Nobody. Knows. No, we're gonna let SWAT take care of it. We're not fell on the ground. It, be hers. it was right here. Put him in a car. Yeah, let's go put him in a patrol car. You got him? I got him. I'll walk him. What is this about? Walk. Walk. We gotta get him in the car. Yeah, get him. What is this about? 911 operator Harris, where is their emergency? I don't, I don't know what is happening. Somebody kicked in the door and shot my girlfriend. Oh my God. Can you check to see where she's been shot at? I can't get on her stomach. No, I okay. Is, oh is she alert God. and able to talk to you? No, I'm mm -hmm. Okay. I'm freezing. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. For the first time, we're given an in-depth look at what exactly happened the night of March 13th, a minute after the hey, shooting of Brianna Taylor. Out. If you're not on SWAT, lift your fire. We're going up. Hey, just remember, the female is supposedly the one that shot. We're not for sure of that. One on me. Give him one. Get Ricky in there. He's out. Hey, she's down at the end of the hall. She is down at the end of the hall. SWAT officers know Taylor is in there, but case the home first. Hey, watch the kitchen. Watch the kitchen. I got the kitchen. It's clear. All right. Nice and slow here, guys. Short, short, clear, clear. As they come to the bedroom, a TV is loudly playing. Good. Cover from the other side. Hang on, let's check the bed. Go ahead. A gun is on the floor. This underneath the bed. Taylor on the floor in the hallway. I'm gonna check her pulse. Ma'am, can you hear us? Full Metro Police Department. Check that wrist, dude. Check the wrist. Medic up. Medic up. Brianna Taylor was pronounced dead at the scene. Uh, two officers who fired a combined 22 shots after Walker fired just one were not charged with any crime. Former Detective Brett Hankison was indicted last month for endangering Taylor's neighbors during the raid, but no one was charged for Taylor's death. Alex Perez, ABC News, Chicago. Our thanks to Alex for that and another update now on Hurricane Delta. The Category 2 storm has officially made landfall tonight near Creole, Louisiana. Winds there reaching 100 miles per hour. This was the first Greek alphabet hurricane to make landfall on record and was the 10th named storm of the season, breaking the record. Storm surge up to 8 feet is expected in Lake Charles. The community is still recovering from Hurricane Laura, which made landfall six weeks ago. We'll continue to follow developments throughout the night. A new report from the Better Business Bureau is warning about con artists posing as Amazon employees to try and steal your personal information. The alert comes ahead of next week's Prime Day event, which will span two days. As Ariel Reshef reports, with so many more of us shopping online during the pandemic, scammers are looking to cash in. Good morning, you day. With Amazon Prime Day just around the corner, the Better Business Bureau out with a new warning that shoppers should be aware of bogus phone calls like these. We placed hold on it, and that order seemed to be fraudulent. Press 1 to talk with Amazon Fraud Department Executive. Callers pretending to work for Amazon, and even more tricky, the calls sometimes show up as legitimate numbers from the Better Business Bureau and other organizations. Once you press one, you open yourselves up to uh, whatever it is they're wanting from you, your 
personal information, your social security, your bank, your driver's license. The BBB says the scammer tells you that there's a problem with your Amazon account, like a lost package or a declined credit card payment. Then they ask for personal information, like your Amazon account login, credit card number, or your date of birth. They're targeting anybody with a phone. So whether it's a business or whether it's, it's somebody who doesn't own their own company, uh, you're a target. Amazon telling GMA it works hard to protect against bad actors that fraudulently use our brand. Some very helpful information. Our thanks to Ariel for that. Amazon says be skeptical of unsolicited calls. Don't make payments outside of their website. Also, ignore demands for urgent action. That's how scammers get you to react without thinking. And now to the new and some would say unusual parenting idea, the three-parent family. One family in California decided to break the traditional family mold and legally bring more than two people into the busy process of raising a child. Becky Worley explains. The modern family has a new twist. Hello. Us? I'm sorry, what's wrong with us? The rise of the three-parent family. And no, this is not about divorce or step-parents. Tavi is a happy, healthy three-year-old, and now meet her mom, her dad, and her other dad. Tavi calls me daddy. Tavi calls me mommy. Tavi calls me dada. Mom and daddy Zeke are a married couple. Dada, David, though, has no biological tie to Tavi and is not romantically involved with either of his co-parents or with anyone for that matter. I uh, identify as asexual and I always have. But he did always want kids. What made you think this was the right choice for you? I definitely had thought about the single parent route um, and it's so much easier to not be doing it alone. How do you broach this arrangement? We spent about five years just practicing being a committed part of one another's lives uh, before we ever raised the topic of kids. David legally adopted Tavi when she was about 18 months old, and now the co-parents split chores, a joint bank account for certain expenses, and even bought a house together. Right now, it is legal in Maine, Washington, California, Rhode Island, and Vermont. By having this legal status in order, that means we're protecting children from having those parental relationships removed. But even a clear set of legal boundaries doesn't always make for smooth sailing. The three co-parents have weekly planning meetings and even a text chain to keep everyone on the same page. Someone once told me it takes three people to raise two children. <laughs> but as they get older, things become much more complicated. Are you worried about that? I, know, I think we will be surprised by hard things, for yeah. sure. <laughs> they, they will happen, absolutely. Um, but I, I think I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of faith in the capacity of our relationship. Yeah. And, you know, we have preventative counseling that we do every mm -hmm. quarter just to talk through any issues that might have bubbled up. And what does Tavi say about it? We were reading a book recently about a donkey and his parents, and, and she was just like, wait, where's the data donkey? And I said, well, not all, not all kids have datas. And she's like, well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Renewed meaning to the idea of a thruple. Our thanks to Becky Worley for that. And when we return, our conversation with the director of the group just awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Plus, the highest of honors the Vatican is set to award this teen who played PlayStation during his short life, plus did so much more. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Hello? This is Montana Highway Patrol. You're looking for a couple of missing teenagers. That's right. When the night Last scene in a red focus. Has come. The steering wheel is getting stiff. Lock the door. We're fine. No, I won't be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. Got ourselves a predicament. When the night has come.
right now at this defining moment in America with so much on the line. From ABC News, a groundbreaking month-long event every night taking on this moment for America. Turning Point, the nightline event, late night on ABC. The best of the Northern Fleet are heading south, but the locals know where the giants lie. The battle lines have been drawn, and the tide is calling. Wicked Tuna Outer Banks, new episode Sundays at 9 on National Geographic. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Welcome back. Today, the Nobel Committee announced that the United Nations World Food Program has won the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize in the midst of a global pandemic that's throwing tens of millions of people into poverty. This group, the world's largest humanitarian organization addressing hunger, has helped close to one million people in 88 countries in the last year alone. And tonight, we have the privilege of welcoming David Beasley, the executive director of the World Food Program and former governor of South Carolina. Thank you so much for joining us and a heartfelt congratulations to you and your team. Well, thank you so much. And I, I can tell you the men and women, we have 18,000 men and women that are out there in the field putting their lives on the line every day in war, conflict zones, and, and you name it. And so it is indeed an honor uh, to receive this award as an inspiration to others to step up and help people around the world. Because quite frankly, this is a, a very tragic time in world history. And we were completely caught off guard this morning. When someone walked in this morning, I was in a meeting. I'm here in Niger and Burkina Faso as we speak because this is an area that's just been hit because of extremist terrorist groups and climate change. And so I was in a meeting and someone walked in and said, the Nobel Peace Prize. And I'm like, gosh, who won it? Who won it? You know, they said, we did. And I was just like, oh my goodness. It was such a surprise. And, and that's good news. And the bad news is the fact that we are winning it is, is not good because that means people are suffering around the world. Right. And speaking of that, before COVID-19, 135 million people across the world suffered from acute hunger. But your organization says that that number could actually double because of the pandemic. What have your teams been seeing on the ground since COVID-19 and, and how has the oh. virus impacted your work? It has impacted our work in a lot of different ways. And before COVID, as you were saying, we literally had gone from 80 million people on the brink of starvation three years ago to 135 million before COVID. And that was because of man-made conflict in climate extremes. COVID comes on top of what you already thought was a worst case scenario and has compounded, exacerbated problems around the world. And now from 135 million to 270 million people on the brink of starvation. And when you break that down from country to country, you begin to see the tragedy that we're facing all over the world. And it is literally horrific. But we've got a vaccine against starvation. It's called food. And the hunger pandemic and the health pandemic, COVID together, we can solve them, but we can't solve one in a vacuum at the isolation of the other. We have to work together. It's critical. Otherwise, the cure will be worse than the disease. I love that there's a vaccine for hunger and it's called food. The chair of the Nobel Prize Committee said that UN organizations, including yours, are now finding it harder to get the necessary financial support from countries. She also said that without support, the world could be facing a hunger crisis of inconceivable proportions. Why is funding such a struggle right now? And just how concerned are you about it? 
Well, you know, the, the budget we received for this year was about eight point some odd billion dollars. And that was 2020. And that was based upon the 2019 budgetary process and the economies were strong. Uh, expectations were good. But all of a sudden, everything got upside down. And so for 2020, we had quite a bit of money, never enough, of course, to, to help address an overt famine around the world in 2020. But $17 trillion by the major economies in the world were put in to stimulating the local economies and reserve funds were given to help people, uh, organizations like the World Food Program. So we averted famine and staved off destabilization and mass migration. But 2021, the end of 2020, is now knocking on our door. There's not going to be those reserve funds available. And now the economic deterioration is taking place. Remittances are down over $100 billion in the poorest countries around the world. The economies of the, of the strongest nations on earth are struggling. We're not going to have the money we need next year. And not only are the resources going to be going down, the needs are going to be going up, as you said very clearly, from 135 million people. Not, I'm not talking about people going to bed hungry. I'm talking about people knocking on the door of starvation, going up to 270 million people. We reach about 100 million people right now, and we've got to reach more, and we've got to have more money. If we have the money, we can stop famine. We can keep people from dying from hunger. We can stave off avert destabilization. We can avert mass migration. And this is a time right now that the billionaires who have made billions on COVID, they need to step up right now. We need five extra billion dollars to help 30 million people from starvation. And if those billionaires who've made billions will step up and say to humanity, we care about you. This is what we need at a time such as this. And speaking of that financial support, I mean, as we mentioned already, you are the former Republican governor of South Carolina, but have been out of politics for a long time. The world's political climate does have an effect on your funding and partnerships. So how do you navigate getting the support that's so desperately needed? Well, you know, one of the things that I do very clearly, and it doesn't matter whether you're from the left or the right, Democrat or Republican, I'll lay it out very clearly. If we don't support the people we're talking about, you can expect famine, destabilization, mass migration, and those are 100 times more costly than prevention, resilience, and sustainable programs. And that's what we talk about. It's going to cost a lot more otherwise. And quite frankly, I, I, you know, the Democrats and Republicans in Washington and across America are fighting literally like cats and dogs all over the place on anything. But when it comes to food aid and international aid with programs like the World Food Program, our funding, this is remarkable, went from $1.9 billion to $3.4 billion. So we had both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue from the Trump administration to the Republicans and Democrats in on the other end coming together saying we care about food security. We understand its relationship to peace and stability. And so that's the good news in the United States where the American taxpayer understands the value of these types of programs of helping people. That's the heart of the American people. And I'm so proud of what the Republicans and Democrats have done in this regard. And because we've used peace, we've used food as a weapon of peace, even in the United States uh, Capitol. And lastly, before we let you go, what are just some ways that the people at home who are listening right now can can help combat world hunger and be part of the solution? Well, you know, we've got so much wealth around the world and places like where I am right now, Burkina Faso, Niger, where people, they don't even have any food in their in their pantry. Uh, and most of them don't have a pantry. They live hand to mouth. So people in America and around the world that have, you know, any wealth at all can really help in so many ways. They can go share the meal, uh, go on the Internet and do that. They can reach out to their communities and their neighborhoods. They can call their congressmen, say, step up, do more to help the people that are struggling around the world because we're facing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. And there's no doubt in my mind, I know the heart of the American people and people around the world. If they know there's a need, they'll step up, they'll reach deep in their pocket because these are our brothers and our sisters and we can't fail them at a time like this. Mr. Beasley, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you for what you're doing and congratulations again. Thank you so very much. 
And before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look. This is Carlo Acutis, a servant of God, according to the Catholic Church. He was born in 1991. He was known to play video games and had a love of PlayStation, but he also set up a website dedicated to miracles and according to the church, since his death from leukemia in 2006, has been responsible for some of those miracles as well. Tomorrow, he will become the first millennial beatified and he will become a saint. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a great weekend.